Yeah. Welcome to the third round um, of, uh, of the middle part of the conference. And uh, coming hour, we will discuss mobility infrastructure in public space. Um, uh, the door yeah, can be open, but please, everybody who's now coming in late should come all the way in the front. All the way in the front, because it's nicer if you, all the way in front, latecomers need to come in all the way in the front. Thank you. I'm going to say that for another 20 times now. Uh, good. So, w what are we going to discuss the coming hour? We're going to talk uh, about the questions how we deal with public space in these new developments. Because, of course, all of you know it's not only used for movement, it's also a very important space of city life. Um, how do we make sure we build infrastructure and assets that are future proof? We have two keynote speakers. Um, they will give a presentation, and after every, present, uh, this, every presentation, will be followed by a possibility to ask questions for clarification um, and for debate or discussion or, or confronting, meeting the minds, your own vision and asking a response from uh, the keynote speaker. Um, it's going to be a, a click, a very intense clickable click session because our first speaker has 25, uh, 20 minutes um, and then we have five minutes of questions um, and he has uh, 78 slides. So, and, and the clock is over there. So, he's an advisor, um, innovation and foresight at the International Transport Forum and give him a warm welcome to the stage. Philippe Christ. Nothing like a, a challenge at the beginning. Uh, so I work with the International Transport Forum. We're an intergovernmental organization based in Paris. We have 59 member countries around the world. And although our members are at the level of national governments, we deal a lot with urban transport. And so today I'll be talking about one of the things that we're talking about here, which is the, the need to think about how to respace urban mobility. Respace it in our heads, of course, but also respace it in our cities, on our streets and on our curbs. I'll talk about three things today. I'll talk about some slogans that you all know, that you all use, and sometimes uh, that you use uh, probably in ways that you uh, have not expected. I'll talk about the convergence that we're seeing in our streets, on our cities, uh, and around the world. And then I'll finish about uh, this issue of respacing and give you five areas where we think uh, this kind of respacing will take place in cities and how it might take place. Slogans. Now, when we talk about mobility in the city today, uh, Angelo just talked about this as well. We have this idea of the smart city. We have this idea of, of the hyper-efficient city. We have this idea of a, of a revolution that's taking place in our cities, a mobility revolution. And, and every revolution needs its slogan. Our slogan, the one that I hear repeatedly around the world, is smart everything now. And this is based on the conception of a smart city being something that is the result of a hyper-efficiency in our cities, of engineering the optimized city. And it comes from the idea that we can optimize certain environments, like buildings, to be machines for living. And we take this further and apply it to our cities and think about how can our cities become machines for living. Now, for those of you who study history, you'll know that most successful cities, almost every successful city in the world, has never been terribly smart. They've been a bit chaotic, they've been a bit messy, they've been cities where there has been an engine for serendipity and randomness, because this, this is where the smartness of city lies. It lies with people meeting people, with ideas coming out of nowhere, with creative energy being created by chaos, manageable chaos, but still chaos. We have to keep in mind that we have to give space for this serendipity, space for this randomness in our cities. And one of the things that, maybe it's a myth, uh, if you will, when we talk about mobility, is that we think that moving things uh, is really where a lot of value comes from in mobility. Um, but in fact, very little of value happens when things are moving, unless you're cycling, unless you're walking. What happens of value in cities is when people stop moving and when they get out of their vehicles, when they sit down with each other, when they talk to each other, when they work and when they think together. This is the value of a smart city. 
And the smart city is not a city for movement. It is a city for accessibility. A smart city that does not focus on accessibility is neither smart and arguably it's probably not even a city. Little caveat before we start working on convergence. Now, you have seen it on the streets of Amsterdam. I see it around the world. Mobility in our cities used to be a fairly, I'm not going to say easy uh, problem to, to, to manage, uh, but it's been more trivial than it is today because now we see a number of new ways of moving around. Um, some of these ways will probably be around for a long time. Um, some of them will already be gone by the time uh, you meet again next year for this conference. All of this is enabled, these modes are enabled by this layer of digitalization that we see in our cities. And of course, part of these modes, some of these technologies will become self-driving uh, in the next 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, we don't know. But automation of various forms of transport is something that we think we'll have to contend with, especially in certain parts of the city. What a lot of people aren't necessarily thinking about right now is how these systems will start thinking for each other. The algorithmization of transport, the infusion of artificial intelligence in transport is something that we as regulators, and I'm talking about our national governments and our city governments, are not prepared for. We deal with law in paper, we deal with laws that are made for human consumption. We don't know what laws and what rules and regulations for artificial intelligence looks like. And that is a big gap and one that we have to think about when we think about the cities of the future. All of this is converging and it's converging not just in cities, it's not converging just in the transport sector, it's converging, ev converging everywhere in society. And this causes a lot of, let's call it anxiety, anxiety and excitement about what to do going forward. So let's make it concrete. Let's start with a very specific piece of urban infrastructure, one that has gotten a lot of attention and that is part of the re-spacing revolution that we're seeing in many of our cities. And this is a piece of infrastructure that has become important as we shift from a parking city to a pickup and drop off city. That is this, it's not here actually, but it looks very similar to this, is the curb face. It's a small barrier between the street and the sidewalk where all the interaction value in transport takes place because goods are being carried across it, people are being carried across it. This is the engine of economic activity that comes from transport in cities and yet it is an ignored space because our relationship with the curb is, how can we put it, it's complicated. We do a lot of things with our curbs. Here, for example, we'll store two-wheeled, this is in Barcelona by the way, Shout out to Barcelona. They've actually done a lot to manage the curb. Motorized two-wheelers. We've put in place bicycle infrastructure and non-motorized infrastructure. There's a separation value here because that keeps the cyclist safe from the car doors opening. Behind it, you can see a shared bike system that's been put in place at the curb. Behind it, or next to it, you see that waste uh, collection is part of one of the uses that we use the curb for. And then parking, of course, and then double parking, illegal parking for freight delivery. All this takes place at the curb. When we see what is happening in cities that have adopted many new forms of mobility, um, I'm not necessarily saying they're better, but new forms of mobility, we see that the curb is the first thing that comes under pressure. And this is, uh, in the case here of New York, um, for ride sourcing, a dangerous phenomena not only because of the traffic that's caused by double parking, triple parking, but because people who are accessing these vehicles are having to step out into traffic. And that's something that right now we have not thought about in the design of our curb spaces in cities. That is because in many places, and I'm not actually, uh, this is not actually the case in cities like Amsterdam, but we have tended to think of the curb recently or, or in the past and up until recently as a place to store private property, to store vehicles. Um, in many places around this world, the world, this storage is free, it's not priced. Uh, and this is something that is not tenable going forward, especially when we see the development of many of the new mobility services uh, that we see picking up in Paris, in Mexico City, in Beijing, in India. There are three challenges that we'll have to manage when we look at thinking about reusing the curb more dynamically. And one is to relocate parking where it's still going to be necessary. The second one is to convert parking, and I'll touch on this in a little bit, into other uses. And the final one is to make that use of space more flexible. And that last one is really important because we have to start thinking of curbs as more flexible, dynamic, self-adjusting spaces. Now, that's easy to say, 
Um, and it's something that has to be built and architected for the future because it certainly can't happen today the way in which we manage information about that space in cities. But we can imagine at some point in the future having a flexible use of that curb being, man being operated by information that's provided by the city, by information that's ingested by services in real time that allows the city to actually determine and the authorities in the city to determine what are the best uses for that curb over the course of the day. Now, how do cities communicate their intent, what they would like to see this space being used for? Well, today they use a very analog way, signs on posts, not always the clearest, not always the most transparent, and even when you ask cities, do you have a good vision of how your curb space is used, they'll say, not really, because for parking, it'll be in one department, for the fire department, it'll be in another department, for freight delivery, pick up and drop off zones, it'll be yet in another department. So there is a real challenge that even when we try to think about making this clear, we have to really think about the ways in which curbs will be used. And one of the main ways in which they'll be used by commercial services, not by individuals, is going to be in code, it's going to be in software, it's going to be in algorithms. And in order to manage that communication, we have to think about how to code the curb, coding the curb in a machine-readable language so that it can be ingested by the back office systems of Uber, of DHL, of taxi companies, of public transport companies. We can see around the world that there are a number of instances where this is starting to take place. Uh, creating this new regulatory language, a syntax, if you will, is something that uh, a few cities are looking at. Uh, many are starting to think about putting it in, into place. Um, I think here we have to think about a two-way communication between the city and those regulated entities that are actually using city space commercially. Um, one is that the city has to be able to receive information about the use of that space and mandate the reception of that data. And the other one is that the city and the authorities have to be able to push out what they expect for the use of that space in machine-readable form, machine-readable laws, machine-readable code. One city that has started doing that, at least in North America, with a very promising beginning is the city of Los Angeles. And they've put in place the mobility data specification, which is actually a syntax for doing just what I've described. And it's been picked up by about 20 cities right now in North America. And I suspect, much like the general transit feed specification grew worldwide for a simple way of communicating how public transport services can be used, you'll be hearing a lot about the MDS, the mobility data specification. When we think about allocating curb uses to the best, most efficient um, uh, actors and, and uses, we have to be able to measure that productivity, measure how well the curb is being used. And one of the things that we think is lacking right now are curb productivity indexes, indexes that allow us to see how many important events, pickup and drop-offs, freight passengers, are taking place per unit of linear or square space per unit of time. Uh, without those metrics, we wouldn't know, for example, as they've seen in the city of New York, that bike share is one of the most effective uses of curb space in cities. Uh, the city of San Francisco has looked at this in a number of corridors, and here's just one, where you can see in blue the number of passengers per unit of space per hour, buses, of course, producing the highest number of turnover, parked cars producing the lowest. But let's see how the city allocates space they allocate a tremendous amount of space to the lowest, least efficient use of that space, the parked car. So this kind of metrics help us, this kind of metric helps us reallocate and rethink the way in which we uh, um, think of this space and manage it, um, hopefully not statically, but dynamically. We have to make room for public transport, for ride services, freight delivery, for cycling at the curb, where this aligns with strategic priorities. We shouldn't take a one-size-fits-all approach to only give space to, for example, in this case, cars, and not allow other forms of pickup and drop-off activities to take place when they are more important for the city. Uh, cities, again, uh, in North America that have faced perhaps the greatest pressure from ride sourcing and ride hailing services are starting to reallocate space away from parking to pick up and drop off zones. And this was a pilot that started in Washington, DC. There are others that are taking place, but now they're in the city of Washington, revisiting their zoning policies for curb use throughout the entire city and putting in place a number of pick up and drop off zones around the city and taking out 
parking for that. We have to make room for new uses and, and users uh, when this again aligns with strategic priorities for the city. And, and we have seen in a number of cities uh, the arrival of new forms of bicycle use, new forms of micromobility that has put pressure on the curb. And here too, cities have a role and uh, a responsibility to communicate how they would like that space to be used. And uh, we also, in this case, think about uh, how to dynamically manage that space, as I said. And that dynamic management, uh, of course, requires some uh, allocation of space, uh, but it goes beyond that. And with geofencing, with geotagging, the city of Paris, for example, is just putting in place their um, geofencing map for scooters throughout the city. Uh, we can envisage a more dynamic way of managing some of these new arrivals. In the city of Amsterdam, uh, you have the use in some cases of changeable LED lights that allow you to very quickly repurpose space uh, over the course of the day and night. And I think this is the kind of use that is helpful going forward, the kind of dynamic communication of how space can be used without having to lock in one use over the course of the day with paint and with concrete. We need to think about, because parking is, of course, a great uh, revenue source for, for cities, how we will um, shift that revenue for a new type of use of the city to pick up and drop off use of the city. Uh, one of the things that we're investigating this year at the, the ITF is how to actually structure a curb kiss fee, uh, a fee for every economically important uh, interaction that takes place at the curb that replaces a parking fee model because this is not a free space. It is a rare and economically important space, and so it, ha it should be priced. And now I'll finish about uh, talking about a few of the future respacing challenges that we see in cities very quickly. And I think the first one uh, we touched on just earlier is that uh, I'm talking here about how to rethink the curve, but we have to rethink um, the vision of the city that we have right now, it's very much a, a two-dimensional city. Uh, I think what we'll see uh, in some form in many cities going forward is a shift from a ground floor city to a rooftop city. And, and what I mean by that is that when this bad boy arrives in town um, and if cities license them for different uses, you'll see a city where uh, every possible window, every possible rooftop can become a drone port. Cities that are not anticipating right now to have a drone port policy that restricts where drones can land and under what conditions will face the dreaded black sky phenomena. And I think this is an important message for cities going forward and I'm glad to see that Amsterdam is already thinking about this. Having a drone port policy, even when you don't control the sky, because in most cases, that's the authority of national um, governments. Having a drone port policy makes good sense because it is like parking policy. It allows you to manage demand by determining when and under what conditions vehicles stop in your city. In this case, they're drones. I think another thing that we can see is a shift from a shopping city, in many cases, to a showroom city. I was just in New York and I walked from North, from Central Park, all the way down to Wall Street. And, and I was shocked at the number of shops that were closed in, in very popular districts. And I think part of that can be linked to the Amazon effect or the, the e-shopping effect. That a lot of us, for many goods, not everything, shop electronically, and this is something that we see growing all parts of the world, including in Europe, including in Asia. What does that mean? That means that a lot of commercially valuable real estate at the ground floor will no longer have the same commercial value as before. What we can see already is that big stores are re being replaced by showrooms where you just see what it is that you then order online. That is going to have an economic impact on real estate values in cities, and I don't know what the city looks like when the value of ground floor real estate drops tremendously. When shops start going out, there cannot be enough services to replace those. And so cities need to already start anticipating what value, what kind of zoning do we give to that ground floor if we're to see this start happening. And the last one is we have to think about how new technologies will shift our model from a station city to a ubiquitous city, to a ubiquitous mobility city. And by that, I mean looking at the traditional way that we consider real estate values in the city. For example, the center having the highest real estate values and these decay as you get further away. And around suburban rail stations or other transport nodes, we see values go up again. 
I think one of the things that we can anticipate, because we saw it already with cars back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, is that new technologies, automated driving, ubiquitous mobility will flatten that curve. And that means it'll change the value of real estate holdings for real estate companies, and it'll change the tax profile that cities can derive from different sources, from different types of developments that they're building around the city. The impact of transit-oriented development of uh, of these type of uh, developments that focus on the value that's added by transit nodes will probably decrease, will probably erode. I don't think completely to zero. I don't think that's reasonable, but I think there will be a change in the economics of land values around the city with the arrival of these technologies. And this is, again, something that cities should be anticipating. Lastly, I don't think um, we need to panic. We have been here before. We have failed miserably at the introduction of new technologies in our cities, and yet we've been able to claw our way back. It took 50 years, so my entire lifetime, to do it this time. I think that now we're better prepared to shorten that gap um, with the lessons that we learned, and in particular with the, type of, the kind of anticipatory policies that I've described. We can come back to a planning for the city that enhances our humanity and doesn't just enhance the ability for our machines to get around. Thank you very much. I'm going to allow some questions. Okay. Yeah, if you're okay with that. Absolutely. Yeah, who would like to ask a question or comment on the presentation? Please introduce yourself before you ask a question. Uh, I'm Jan Straub from the city of Amsterdam. I'm a, a, a developer for a new. Uh, urban areas. Um, you announced the death of di distance in your second to last slide. That's not the first time that the death to distance is uh, declared, yeah. pronounced, yeah. and every time it didn't work out. So why will it, will, it, will it happen this time? I didn't announce the death of distance. I, I announced the relative decrease in importance of distance. Yes. And, and I think but that... But Dutch people are uh, very good in overreacting. <laughs> are, so are, so are, you say a relative <laughs> decrease so we, for it's uh, into... This is, the French, death. This is yes. my French side coming yeah. So the relative decrease of importance. I think yeah. it's a valid point because we have seen that announced in the past. What uh, I didn't say um, is that the change in the decay of distance function that we see is linked intric intricately to the policies that cities put into place. Cities are not... Um, innocent and only receivers of what happens in their space. They control and manage it. And so I think the larger point here is cities have to think about what might be the potential impacts of some of these new technologies that in some cases they welcome. I'm not saying Amsterdam does, but I've seen many cities who've welcomed them unquestioningly. And in those scenarios, yes, you will probably see an erosion of that decay function. And it's not just science fiction because we saw it happen in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, in places like um, smaller and medium-sized cities in France, in places like in the United States, in places even outside of the United States and Asia. Response? Uh, of course, it happened in the 60s in Amsterdam as well. Yeah. Everyone was leaving the city because they, they thought we had to build a, a central business district yeah. in the city center. Luckily, we didn't. Yeah. Uh, and now, um, as we uh, focus on the small scale of the city, people want to come back and they're not coming back because it's so easily accessible by car, because yeah. it's not. Um, they come because it's nice. Absolutely. Because the, because the environment is, is nice for meeting and meeting is what you do face to face yeah. and not via the internet or shopping or whatever. So, and, and that won't change, I think. I, I, think, one thing, I think one thing that will change, um, and, and first off, let me say with, open with the caveat that when I go around the world and I speak, uh, I'd say about 80% of the times people say, why can't we be more like the Netherlands? Why can't we be more like Amsterdam? And, and I tell them, Amsterdam isn't even like Amsterdam was before. And so there's a lot of work that's taken place here to make this city and this region and the rest of the country and livable. What, and what, because we, we sometimes forget, why, why, do, would, why does the world want to be like Amsterdam? Well, because I think what they see, um, and this goes to your point, is that there is an approach of engineering a city to optimize one or two uses. So um, economic productivity, uh, traffic fluidity. Um, and that is often the prevailing view. And, and you know, I was just traveling in Indonesia. And that is still the prevailing view in a lot of places. But what that ignores is what I was saying at the outset, which cities are not engines for movement. 
their cities, cities are engines for accessibility. They're engines for contact. And so I think one thing that you can see that's happened in the Netherlands and some other cities is that we have not forgotten that lesson or we, we've relearned it. But that isn't the case in, I would say, most places in the world. And, and the, the distance decay function is changing in those places. It changed already with the arrival of a car. And they have not learned the lesson of Bologna. They have not learned the lesson of Amsterdam. They have not learned the lesson of Copenhagen. They have not learned the lesson, arguably, of Paris. Uh, and so there's still a lot of work to be done. Who wants to raise a question? Yeah. Yes, hello. Um, I think it would be very interesting. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm Eki Kreisberger from the Delta University of Technology. Mm -hmm. It would be very interesting if you could make a differentiation between parts of the world. Mm -hmm. You're really questioning that things will not take place uniform. So why would you think that, and, uh, that, and how will they differ in Europe than the States, than in Asia, and so on? Uh, about two years ago, I was sent to, um, to be embedded in Silicon Valley. And uh, as one way of helping our, our governments understand a lot of the technology services and, and um, products that were being developed there. And, and what I realized very quickly is something that I suspected. Um, a lot of the technical innovation, technology innovation that takes place and has come out not only from there, but principally from there, is based on the failure of policies that we take for granted in a lot of places in Europe. Um, there is, for example, in the Bay Area, dysfunctional public transport. There is disjointed land use planning. There is, even in what is arguably perhaps one of the more European, at least in the downtown part of San Francisco, um, cores in North America, a car centricity that is shocking for someone that, that lives in Europe. And, and the fact that the innovations like ride sourcing, like micromobility services, like some of the dockless bike shares have, have grown in this environment isn't surprising because they're growing where there are real needs. So that's not to say that those, those developments don't make sense in some form in other contexts. They certainly make sense in Asia where the motorization curve is not yet on the same trajectory uh, as it has been in Europe or in North America. There is an argument to be made that if you can develop these services for a more broad understanding of shared mobility that goes beyond traditional public transport, um, but in conjunction with public transport, you can actually depress that curve, uh, that motorization rates would not reach the level that they've reached in Europe or North America. So, and, and I think we see, we see that in a lot of other places around the world where urban densities are so high that it makes it difficult to imagine the type of motorization rates that we've seen in North America or even in, in Europe. And in those settings, um, I think this anticipatory thinking about how to conceive of I mean, public transport, for the lack of a, a, a better word, but it's really, it's a broader understanding of shared transport does make sense. Because if that can be made more compelling, less expensive, less hassle than owning a car, then you can diffuse some of the, the car lust, the car um, uh, desire that has led motorization in Europe and in North America in the past. And, 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 and one thing on that is that there are a lot of areas where there are extensive and effective, well, relatively effective forms of, of um, informal public transport. And one of the things we see is the type of platform approaches that have been put out by technology companies in the US and Europe uh, also make sense for trying to improve the efficiency of the informal networks of public transport. Jetty, for example, in Mexico City. We see it in Southeast Asia with Gojek, which is a, a platform for motorized two wheels, two wheelers. Yeah. Thanks for these questions. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna leave it at that because okay. of time constraints. Thank you so much. Give him a big thank you, Philippe Christ from Paris. Let's go to the second speaker, keynote speaker. She's the senior manager of combined mobility at the uh, UITP, the International Association of Public Transport. Give her a warm welcome to the stage, Caroline Serfontaine. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. It's always a challenge speaking after Philippe because he's so entertaining and into his topics. But anyways, I know it's late in the afternoon. I hope you still have a bit of attention left for the rest <laughs> of the presentation. So um, very quickly about my presentation. It's looking at 
the theme of the day, mobility and urban planning, how to integrate them, and how we see public transport as being the backbone of um, any new urban development that happens in the city. Two words about the um, association I work for. So it's UITP, the International Association of Public Transport. We are a worldwide association having members in 99 countries um, all over the five continents of this, of this um, planet. And uh, we have 17 offices around the world. The main office is in Brussels, where I work as well. So we unite the whole urban mobility um, stakeholder community, having operators of all sorts of different modes uh, on board, from public transport to bike sharing over car sharing and ride sharing, the authorities and cities, um, the industry as well, um, the research institutes, academia, and other associations. So that's who we are. So um, I'm going to start my presentation a bit similarly to the one that Rebecca did this morning with a picture from before the car age. At that time, our cities were actually growing nicely alongside tramway or metropolitan railway lines and people would have directly access to the city centers and there would be lots of space left for people meeting, um, discussing, doing business, um, having leisure time. Then we've come to um, the car age, where the car has come, which has led to more urban sprawl, uh, because all of a sudden distances had become much uh, smaller, and we faced um, this period of car-based development that is quite nefast to our cities. So um, we have learned that this is not a sustainable way of growing, that we have a lot of negative impacts coming from that, be it from air pollution or just um, not having enough urban space anymore to um, actually offer people the place they need to live and work in cities. So we have to come to a sort of compromise. So I found this very nice picture um, from Amsterdam, actually, because I think that um, it is quite well known that the Netherlands are already a nation of planners. You plan ahead very well. And so, so I think your cities um, are already quite, quite livable. But anyways, maybe um, I can show some examples from around the world where they are also looking at these sort of things. So at UIT, we, we believe that there's three main pillars to come to a balanced traffic system to reach that compromise where we have space for everyone to move, everyone to live, and everyone do uh, business. So these three pillars are the development of sustainable travel options. And here we're looking at developing nice areas to walk and cycle, nice public transport, and also looking at all the new mobility options that are coming into place. That's sort of the, the carrot to attract people towards something else than car ownership and single car usage. Then we get over to the sort of stick more, which is the control of car traffic and parking management, which is um, quite important, and that's where we have to play a role as city authorities to make sure that um, we have cars where we want them and we don't have them where we do not want to have them. And then the last pillar on this slide, but which is probably the one that comes ahead of everything, which is the planning. And there we need the integrated planning of public transport and urban development, which is crucial to lead our ways onto a sustainable, uh, our cities, sorry, onto, onto a sustainable path. So let's go um, first to how we see and how we would like to redefine public transport at UITP. So we clearly see that um, walking, cycling, and mass public transport is the most efficient way of moving around in the city. But we also see that there's many new mobility options coming up, and there's more and more all the time. Um, and what we would like to consider at UATP as being public transport is all the modes that are of public, public access and or of collective use. So we want to englobe all these and um, try to see how public transport planning can also work with these new mobility services and look at what are the innovative sites that they got better than public transport because we know that um, there's certain services that we as public transport do not like to provide, one bus in the morning, one in the evening. It's not a nice service to provide, it's a survival option. So we see new, new modes can maybe match demand and supply in a more efficient way and we can learn from that. So we have to take the best of both worlds by keeping into mind what are our strategic objectives, what do we want to reach, and we take what is good for us and we reject what is not good for us. And that's a very important um, part our authorities need to play to ensure that we get to 
to that differentiation between the different impacts. So when it, when it comes to the integration of public transport and urban development, there's different aspects that need to be um, kept in mind. First of all, looking at the process, the involvement and coordination of all relevant actors has been mentioned already several times today. But by all relevant actors, it really means going from talking to the business community, of course, to all the planners, all the mobility stakeholders, the cities, the authorities, and involving the citizens and the civil population, consulting them, knowing what do they want, how can we accommodate them so that they really endorse the different projects. Then there's, of course, thinking of public transport since the very beginning of any project, which is not given. I mean, we've seen many nice examples today. We've seen the Vauban. Um, neighborhoods in, in Freiburg, then we've seen very nice developments in Rotterdam and Amsterdam here as well, where they really try to integrate and use public transport as a backbone. But it's not always been the case. How many developments are taking place without any public transport at all? And once they're done, they call public transport and say, hey, you have to give us a bus line or something like that. <laughs> well, maybe a bus line wasn't quite um, the service that would, be, would have been needed, needed proportionate to the number of people that live in that area. So we would never build a new neighborhood without building a road, so why do we build new neighborhoods without building public transport in it? So that's the first thing we need to think about. And then we also look at the content. It's about integrating new options and mobility in the city to keep life within the city centers and then having a focus on the stations, which are actually much more than stations, but we heard a lot of this today as well. So a um, few examples from around the world, looking at policy frameworks, and it starts there with the institutional fragmentation that we sometimes face in our cities. Often urban planning um, is not in the same office as mobility planning or transport planning. Sometimes it is, as um, in Vienna. You also know probably this picture of Copenhagen, which shows the, the finger plan. So um, the finger plan was first mentioned, I think, in the 50s and then started to be realized bit by bit. And um, you can see, I don't know if the pointer works here. Yeah, it does. So um, they, they wanted to have the urban development going alongside metropolitan railway routes. And this is what's actually happened. And so it is a nice way of offering people new homes that are directly connected to a high capacity line, enabling them to move to the city center in, a, in an efficient and, and quick way. Another example from Oslo, where before looking at PT-oriented development, they made lots of studies. Um, and they wanted to see, so what's the, what's the impact actually if we go for urban sprawl? What's the impact if we go for densification? And you can clearly see that densification um, gave less car traffic, um, better environment, and much lower cost. So that's the path that they chose. And also from an institutional point of view, uh, RUTO, the public transport authority, is closely working together with the, the city planning and urban development planning um, of, of the, the wider region of, of Oslo. So um, Singapore just did a study to, to Singapore and was quite impressed by the way they uh, the, the level they have taken planning to. Um, they um, have now launched a new land transport master plan. Land and transport are already in the same plan and the same word, so you can see it's done in a totally integrated way. They are building, the city is growing, so um, Singapore is a sort of new city, so any development is a, is a greenfield development, which also makes it much easier than in our built environments that we know in, in Europe and in the Netherlands. But um, they are quite focusing on really integrating public transport into their development. So whenever they build a new town, they call it a new neighborhood, they will always build it around a new MRT, a new metro station. So this is how it goes, and they invest um, quite a lot into that because um, they have a lot of catching up to do. But they are building one kilometer of metro per month, and they're, as they say, they're popping up a new station every two months. So uh, it is quite quite impressive. But it really gives people then the opportunity to um, to move around without having to own a car, which is anyways very difficult. And here to build this new land transport master plan, they wanted really to have the opinion of the city. So they worked together with the civil population. They did a big consultation so to ensure that the citizens of Singapore also endorsed that plan. What comes out of that is the car light vision for Singapore. It's the walk, um, cycle, and ride Singapore. 
So that strategy is actually centered around um, active mobility, shared transport, and mass public transport. And that's really the three pillars that they want to build, any new development that they do um, around. One example that I've seen is um, Tenga, which is really a car light development. So um, cars will not be allowed anymore. It's only walking and cycling on the first layer. Then there will be, of course, the MRT stations and some bus lines. There's also room for autonomous mobility, shared autonomous mobility, obviously integrated into that. And these are pictures from the um, HDB, it's called, it's the Housing Development Board. But I visited it with some Singaporeans, and these are obviously only pictures, but they say um, you at least get 80% of what you see, and if they plan it that way, that's how, how it will look like. So um, that's a very nice way of seeing how you can really, from a planning side, if you decide as an authority this is how it's going to be, push for much more sustainable development of mobility options and new urban developments. Another example from closer to here, from Vienna. So they had this former airport in Aspern, a bit outside of the city, that they needed to redevelop because Vienna is also a city that is quite successful and that is growing. So they needed more um, places, more accommodation, more um, job opportunities. So they redeveloped that area, so it's a brownfield area, but they started with building the metro line. So they made sure that once people will go there, the metro run before the first inhabitants were living there. On top of that, of course, comes a lot of um, planning on the, the bike lanes and the walking facilities, car sharing integrated also in new developments. Same sort of example from Copenhagen. So this uh, Copenhagen, also a very successful city that is growing. So here um, they are building these new islands um, and they are integrating a metro line in there. What is quite funny is that they are using, I mean, of course, you need a lot of earth to build these new islands. And they're building a circular metro line in the city center and they're using that land to build these islands over there. So it's all in the circular economy. And again, um, it's a new development taking place already with public transport at the heart of the, the neighborhood. So it's really a, also about urban regeneration, a lot of our built areas. It's not always the chance that we have to build new neighborhoods. Um, need to be regenerated. If you have been to Montpellier 20 years ago, it didn't look at all as it looks today. And by reintegrating walking and cycling facilities together with public transport into the city, they really managed to regenerate that area. An example from Latin America showing that it is important to actually put high density developments close to where good transport options are. You can see that this is the BRT line and the high houses are there so that these people have quick access to the BRT development. This is an example from Bulgaria where they created a new BRT system that is quite well connected to a pedestrian area that starts here. And um, it's about creating things and building them in a, in a network. Then we come to the stations that are actually more than stations. We heard about, a lot about mobility points. But it's true that to have all sort of services, you need a certain critical mass um, for the services to be um, also viable from a business model point. And therefore, it can be very interesting to, to match these activities and bring them together and concentrate them in, in one place. So you transform a transit point into a real living place. For example, the Deutsche Bahn in Germany, the railways, they have this, um, this philosophy that whenever they build a station, there's a lot of leisure activities that can happen in there. There's a lot of cultural places, a lot of eating um, facilities, um, so, so that actually people spend time in the station and, and it's also a point to bring people together. So um, it leads to urban revitalization and it's also a way to diffuse the demand via different transport modes. Uh, we saw the Mobi Pünten in Flanders and the very nice Mobilpunkte in, in Bremen. This is another example from uh, Vienna in Simmering, where you really have different sort of options connected all together. That's another example from um, Hamburg, where they're also trying to build these switch points all over the city. I like the example of um, Hamburg very much because the, they have this... Um, 
physical and digital gateway to the integration of transport services. So switch on the one side are these intermodal change um, hubs that they have scattered all over the city, but switch is also a mobility as a service app that integrates the service. So the, the approach is sort of systemic where they integrate both, both things. So what is UATP doing on this? We can clearly see that um, new mobility players are, are coming um, into the landscape and they have an impact, as Philippe was saying, on um, the allocation of space. So we need to rethink how we will manage our space. We um, need to rethink parking. In Helsinki, they did a study where they could see that according to the place in the city, they would regain between 30 to 70% of the um, needed parking space today. So what do you do with that regain space? How do you reuse it in an intelligent way? How do you handle the curb? Because that's also an important thing. How do you do your traffic and urban planning in a sustainable way? So we organized a workshop that was kindly hosted by Transport for London in May last year. We will also have a summit um, in Stockholm coming up in June where we will have a session on it. Um, it's called Beyond the Battle for the Curb, Adapting Cities to New Mobility. The objective is really to understand how cities can manage the rapid deployment, what are the impacts, and what role technology will play on curb access and allocation. So we will have speakers from Sidewalk Labs. We will have Philippe, who will be part of the session as well. We'll have Apur, and then a panel discussion including Uber and Angelo from TaxiStop, and uh, Fit Consulting, who's specialized in freight delivery. So I hope to see you all in, in Stockholm, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? No? So everybody, is it the end of the day? A bit? It is, I think. It's okay, it's okay. <laughs> so, so if, if, if I compare your, your two stories, right? Um, lot, uh, lots is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what is now necessary, because if in, in this context, to take the next step to actually start doing mm -hmm. stuff, right? What's then? I think it's important to bring all stakeholders together. Yeah. So, so it's a governance question. It's a governance question. Yeah. Talking, talking to, yeah. I mean, I, I would really like create these spaces where you have some sort of innovation clusters. You talk to the new companies, you talk to the citizens, you talk to the business community and you try to see what, what do we want and then determine a vision and then plan ahead to make yeah. that vision come true, maybe, hopefully. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Ferdinand Bergesdijk, Ministry of uh, Infrastructure and Water Management Program, MAAS. Um, I'm really curious on what uh, periods of time we're looking at to create these uh, um, uh, understandings uh, between private and public parties to engage on MAAS. You mean like in, in between the different operators of, of services? He wants to start today. When, when, when will he realize it? Is that the question? What the time of the process it takes from the initial start of getting these people together to actually having a system up and running, used by citizens and... You mean like mobility as a service? Or? Yes. Oh, specifically. Well, um, yeah, that depends on who is the one that wants to bring them around the table, I guess. <laughs> if it comes from an authority, it will be easier, I guess. And then okay, it imagine you're from, uh, say, a government, mm -hmm. like the Dutch uh, uh, national government, and you're working in a ministry. <laughs> for, for example, for example, well, just, I just think you're in a really good place. Case. You're in a really good place to to call all actors um, around the table and start the discussion. This discussion now. And then, what time he needs to talk to his management board, and he has to say, "Give me to how many months, years, to to to, to set up the solution." Said, yeah. Huh. Yes, it's a, it's a difficult thing because it depends so much on the expectations of the different business partners and how how you can. Yeah, I I, I couldn't say. <laughs> Oh, 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 maybe Philippe has an idea. <laughs> I, think, I think one of the things that we see here in, for the development of mass, it's a, a good case. I think when we talk about respacing the city or reallocating space in the city, it's, it's another good case, but um, it's a case of having to manage uncertainty. 
uh, and timing around uncertainty. And I think there, there are a few regulatory um, science approaches that help. Uh, and, and the first one of those is actually a lesson that we learned in the Netherlands. Um, and that is on how you plan resilient systems for uncertain futures. And it came specifically from, from dike construction in the Netherlands, where mm -hmm. um, certain dikes were built for but not with the elements necessary if an uncertain future of uh, sea level rise surpassed um, the thresholds that uh, the original construction, construction was designed for. I think that for but not with is an important lesson that we can apply for regulation in this space. For example, uh, when I talked about um, a curb kiss fee, um, we should already think about, as governments, as regulators, enabling that to happen and setting that fee at zero for but not with. And when it becomes an issue, then you have a tool that's ready to go, and then you have a mechanism that's recognized, and then you can start implementing it. I think for mobility as a service, it's the same thing. You have to be able to have a system that allows these, system, these service operators to communicate. So you should think of building for a syntax that can be used by all operators, um, but that necessarily doesn't have to lead to a regulatory requirement. So you can incentivize the use of a common data syntax. Um, but then this, the Finland has done that with the reform of the transport code, where they've made all mobility operators required to publish information on APIs. Yeah. Now, how they use that, that's different. But yeah. it's for, but not with. Yeah, but then it really needs to know, then you have to have some kind of understanding or consensus of what that future will entail, right? I mean, a little bit or well, not. Well, no, because the future is because, uncertain. And yeah. I think, and that's the whole point of that, is you yeah, so, you, you hedge your bets yeah. by, by enabling something to come into play later by the actions that you do today. Yeah. And there's a lot of scariness about actually yeah. engaging today on concrete actions, which is why it's good to provide that safe environment, Caroline, that you were talking mm -hmm. about. Sandboxing, regulatory exemptions, temporary regulatory exemptions, experiment-based learning. I mean, all these are new regulatory tools for a very uncertain future. And I think we, so when I say we, I think public authorities have to become much more comfortable uh, With than that type of uh, regulatory process than the yeah. regulate and forget process. But I, yeah. I, I mean, I kind of agree, Philippe, because you're setting the base for the technological solutions and the barriers are at the moment technological. But um, I think that's not the main barrier. Mm -hmm. The main barrier is the, the, the willingness to cooperate between the different actors. And that's often underestimated. Yeah. Like in Finland, yeah. they solved the techn technological issue. But um, did mass really take up in, yeah. in Helsinki? Is the collaboration good between the different transport actors? Are they cooperating and trying to build something together that is you know growing? You know the answer to these questions already. No, so no, no, it's no, not. no, 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 no. It's but, not. Yeah. So, but so I'd say putting that yeah. regulation before yeah. wasn't maybe the, the, best, the best way to do it because it forces people to sit around the table and people don't like to be forced sitting around the table. Okay, but he doesn't say that. He says, let's prepare for an uncertain future. Yeah, yeah. So that I agree. It, that do you agree? But then you say that's not the whole answer because the, mm. the constraints and the most important barriers are in how are people going to work together? How are institutions mm -hmm. or different actors going to work mm -hmm. together? That's mm -hmm. the biggest barrier. Yeah, building trust amongst the different partners. Okay. And, and it has to be federated on a vision. And that's, yeah. And that's that something I agree. That's, that's really a important. co-created and shared yeah. vision. Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks, Philippe. Um, I uh, uh, agree for you for some part, because I think the Finnish approach didn't uh, work out uh, as they planned, but they did create a, a, a certain uh, framework for trust. Yeah. Um, but I also agree with Caroline, because um, to fill in that trust, that's the hard thing to do. Mm. Uh, we are trying to be more pragmatic in our approach in the Netherlands. Um, with the ministry and the, the mass program, we are launching seven uh, regional but uh, uh, national scalable uh, pilots mm -hmm. um, concerning mass. And um, uh, the hard thing there is actually what we're trying to establish is a, a syntaxis or a language yeah. uh, which all platforms can introduce so to connect them and to create one big ecosystem. But also for going over that threshold is an enormous step for these companies because they're also... Um, 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 they're not willing to cooperate because they're truly still focused on pushing their own products yeah. instead of really helping out the end user. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you think we can get over that? Because I don't think governance will help. It's who steps over the line first. Yeah. No, but the governance is what are the, the 
uh, different decisions you make together to come to sharing data, that is governance, right? Let's what kind of agreement do you want to make together? How, yeah. So, I, okay, first, um, a quick thing on, on Finland then. Okay. I think we have to give him a little bit of time because it was only in July that it was put into place. So She's a bit more critical. So, so who, who knows what will happen? But I, I think that it is an interesting first step. Okay. But let's think about the role of government in difficult situations. And of course, there's the consensus building. But there also has to be a certain pragmatic approach that is sometimes um, decisions have to be made. And, and I'm not saying I know where and, and we know where that threshold is, but I think back in history and try to imagine what was the stakeholder involvement when roads were being developed for um, motorized vehicles in the 1920s and 30s. There was very little stakeholder involvement, and yet that system has created such momentum for hundreds of years. Uh, so I can see that from uh, my own love of democratic discourse, that uh, having a wide stakeholder uh, involvement process is important. But when I look in history, that's not how we ended up here. So, 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 so. There, so I think there's going to be a point in which governments will have to say, this is the line in the sand. Okay. If you want to be, re be licensed to operate services in public space, these are the requirements that we are. Exactly. And, I, and I think that the, the first thing will be a low you know, entrance. Just use the same syntax. You, you know, we will not issue a license to operate in public space unless you publish information using this syntax. Um, but then that gives you the ability later to use that in a regulatory tool like the mobility data specification, um, but not at the outset. But I think we need, to, we need to be own up to the fact that as regulators, we can also um, ask of things, of, of regulated yeah, listen, entities. It's, it's always interesting that in, in planning discussions, there's a lot of uh, discussion what is participatory or co-creation or stakeholder management. Stakeholder ma management does not mean that they shouldn't play their role, right? Mm -hmm. That authority to authorities cannot decide who they're going to license or not. It's not everything is democratic, let's, let's raise hands who wants to be licensed or not. It, I mean, there is also a role to play for public authorities, which but is it, different. It yeah. does lead to outcomes. Like in Singapore, you know, they did have the stakeholder management, and, the end they, and then in the end, they acted quite decisively. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think, I think uh, cities are the ones that are in charge, and authorities yeah. are the ones that need exactly. to, in the end, decide. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, uh, you both talk about um, the, the public space that we can regain. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can also use that for other means, for example, to, to get some health benefits, and especially if you get people to walk and cycle, etc. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps there is a, a part of the solution. Do you have some data to support that? Do you have some health benefits and some numbers? Oh, yeah, uh, my name is Mariana. I work with the uh, Netherlands Commission for the Environmental Impact Assessment, Milieu Effect Reportage. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't have exactly ways to calculate the benefit, but I know that many cities are acting, uh, having health benefits as one of the main goals that they want to achieve. Like London has an inactivity crisis in Singapore as well. Um, so they're taking this healthy street approach, um, which is like re-looking at the streetscape and how can you rebuild it. Um, if you look at uh, the example we saw this afternoon, I don't know if you saw the presentation from Vauban. Uh, okay, so there's the, well, actually they didn't build parking spaces that they should have built and they used them to build green spaces and playgrounds and all, all that kind of thing. So that is, I think, the most speaking example very visually where you can see that inside that neighborhood you really have regained that space and used it for something that is promoting and pushing for much more health, which is uh, quite a nice, nice example. But Philippe has done a lot of modeling. Yeah, a, so few, a, few work, a few years ago we did some work for all of our countries Looking, in fact, the request by our countries was to uh, help give advice on whether or not increasing cycling was safe, and and you know we so said that's a bit of a loaded question. Uh, why are we concerned about safety in cycling? Well, we're concerned about safety because, of course, when you get in a crash, there's a negative health outcome. So we said let's let's ask the question more broadly. Let's talk about health, um, and so we 
did a wide scan, very detailed scan of what it was that we knew about health impacts of active mobility, of walking and cycling. And, and the first two things we saw is yes, crashes uh, create costs for society. Um, and yes, exposure to air pollution. Even though cyclists are exposed to less air pollution than those in vehicles, they actually, um, final deposition in their lungs is greater because of the ventilatory strength uh, that they engage during effort. Um, and so That's there's why you should never jog uh, next to a highway. <laughs> so, yeah. so it started badly, you know, strike out for air pollution, strike out for crashes. And then we looked at all of the, the literature and involved um, some very recent research at that time in 2014 on the health benefits from active activity, physical activity. And the number there was the the um, combined negative, so this is all um, uh, uh, set to a common euro cost. Uh, the monetized e expense of air pollution and crashes was uh, surpassed by 20 times the positive benefit, monetized impact of healthy activity. And when we went to our countries, we said, uh, if you have a, a transport policy that isn't thinking about how you actually um, increase walking and cycling, then you are losing money for your city and for your country. And when it comes to the kind of space that can be released potentially in cities with the arrival of new mobility, that has to be a key factor because that space can be used for all kinds of things. It can be used for cafes. It can be used for um, pick up and drop off zones for freight. It can be used for um, more uh, well uses we haven't even yet thought of. But one thing clearly is that space should be for a large part prioritized for building an activity into everyday life. So so, so you have one reference, one study you've done, but is the there was a, there was a study of studies. So there was study actually study. So there, study. Were, there okay. were 65 different studies that looked at that. She needs to know exactly why, where she can find that data. On the because she's, ITF website. Yeah, okay. Cycling safety and health. But it's on cycling. And the funny thing is your question was, of course, again broader. So you broadened yeah. it from safety and cycling so, so to it, health and cycling. And that's the question. If you have all that public space available, yeah. not for parking anymore, but for other uses, can you also measure the, be the health benefits? for that. One of the interesting things that came out was some of the impacts on mental health. Yeah, of exactly. Not just of activity, but exposure to green space. Yeah. Um, and so I think these, again, are metrics that aren't typically used in transport planning. They are more used in urban planning. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly something we can't ignore going back to this question that we were discussing earlier, which is the mono use of um, urban space in cities. Yeah. And we have to think about what actually is the, you know, what does a broad use of city space look like from a human perspective? Yeah. It includes all these non-movement uses. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much um, for this, for your presentations and the answers to the questions. Give them a big thank you. Okay. Coming all the way to Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. So there is a break now for 17 minutes, exactly 16 minutes and 50 seconds. Um, and then we will have the closing plenary session in which we have a few commercial uh, services who want to be part of the new mo mobility solutions. And I'm going to ask them the difficult questions. Um, and then um, we will have a, a review of what we learned uh, of the day. And we'll close off with a poet. Uh, and then at five o'clock, uh, we will have um, drinks. <laughs>